all expected have already joined. You have given me presenter right now. I can change the slide. Yeah, you can change, sir. Hello. I have already given. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Uh, friends, and second, uh, both topics are very, very uh, important uh, and somehow connected with each other. So, what we'll do. Uh, In this presentation, so we have effective two and a half hour time for uh, this presentation, this training. Uh, let us start this presentation uh, with the uh, preservation first part. Um, the repeat my kit, uh, which I will not read just for your purpose. I am not representing any company in particular for this session. Whatsoever I am going to say, it is the on my own experience of continuous. Um, so uh, no other company where I am working currently or I have worked uh, in past uh, has any relevance to what I discuss with that. Uh, as I outlined the beginning, uh, we'll have two broad sessions, one on preservation and other on confined space. So uh, let's uh, concentrate on uh, preservation. Vessel. All vessels or pipelines, you can see the slides. Hopefully, everybody will to uh, see. Yes, sir, we are seeing the slides. But similar, sir, uh, just not, sir, your voice is breaking, sir, actually. Uh, is it clear now or still breaking? Now it is clear, sir. Am I audible? Clear, na? Yes, sir. You are audible, clear? but uh, uh, sometimes it breaks in. Yeah, sometimes it breaks in between the your flow. Maybe because it's raining uh, outside, so uh, internet may have some uh, problem. Connectivity may have some problem. Okay. 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 Okay, okay sir. Right you right can so continue if. If sound sound breaks, we will uh, postpone the session. Uh, it is still problem. Yes, sir. It is problematic, not uh, coming clear. Yeah, actually, it breaks uh, in between your flow. When you are speaking now, right now it is breaking. Okay, okay, it is breaking. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or, uh, give me one. Let yeah, me yeah. change the look. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, one minute, one minute. Let me check. Participant, participant, we will uh, wait for five minutes. Then afterwards, we will start. Actually, I think uh, in Mumbai, the rainfall oh, is change the location. going on. Yes, let me ch uh, change this location. Uh, I would uh, like to go near window where my connection. So we had just uh, started uh, with our introduction of preservation. Um, it will go all vessels or pipelines on similar arrangements, which is used for carrying, storing, or receiving a steam, gases, or liquid. The condition is that pressure should be above atmospheric pressure. That means any other vessels which used for same purpose, but pressure is below atmospheric pressure, we cannot call it a pressure vessel. It is uh, largely used uh, for generation of steam and storage and conveyance of uh, compressed and liquefied gases. Uh, in a varieties of industries like chemical, petroleum, power, food and beverage, pharmaceuticals. Uh, application of pressure vessel is such like if you exclude pressure vessel from chemical processing, majority of products cannot be manufactured. So some of the applications are highlighted just for reference, like industrial compressed air receivers, domestic hot water storage tanks, Diving cylinders, recompression chambers, distillation towers, autoclaves, reactors, regenerators, pneumatic and hydraulic reservoirs, 
and of course it's storage vessels for liquefied gases such as ammonia chlorium chlorine propane butane and lpg pressure vessels are classified in dozens of uh, way some of the classification based on certain criteria i have listed here uh, for your reference uh, like based on manufacturing method it can be welded or forged multi wall wrapped multi wall vessels or band wrapped vessels based on manufacturing materials we can have three types steel non ferrous and non metallic when i say non metallic uh, that means composite materials uh, hybrid types of material based on geometric shapes also it can have a different uh, uh, classification based on installation methods uh, it can be vertical or horizontal based on pressure bearing situation internal or external pressure vessels even wall thickness is one of the criteria for classifying a uh, pressure vessel thin wall or thick wall based on technological processes this is very important aspect of classifying a pressure vessel it can be reaction vessel heat exchanger separation vessel storage container operating temperature also used for classifying pressure vessels according there can be four classification i'm not reading it because it is available in slides you can okay. based on design pressure it can be low pressure medium pressure high pressure or ultra high pressure vessels based on usage it could be fixed pressure vessel or even mobile mobile is used for transporting and storage common type of pressure vessels include horizontal pressure vessels vertical and spherical pressure vessels let's see a little bit in detail about this on a screen you can see one simple sketch of horizontal pressure vessel the section is given at aa on the other screen you can see a vertical pressure vessel where the ratio of a diameter to vertical dam is about 5 is to 1 here is vertical tower certain information about that given on the screen you can go through that no, not needed to repeat it it is only for academic purpose vertical reactors there some of the photographs given a simple sketch to understand how pressure vessels look like in different this is very common in a particularly reactors uh, atomic power plants and other places you will find even in uh, refineries you will find such spherical pressure vessels let's see the typical components of pressure vessel there are four five components which is available in each and every pressure vessel whether it is horizontal spherical vertical tower or vertical pressure vessel there will be one cylinder or a spherical shell and both ends you will have heads or again a curved surface there will be flying flanges cover plates or simple flanges we call it there are openings various openings that is called nozzles then there is supports so one two three four five five components are there common components in each and every pressure vessel one is shell other is head third one is flanges we call blind flanges cover plates depending upon the locations then openings and nozzles and then supports available for that so as we discussed last slide please remember shell head nozzle and supports are four very important components of pressure vessels let's have a look on shell it is primary component that consists contains the pressure so storage reaction everything takes place in shell so this is the most important component of a pressure vessel it can be cylindrical spherical or conical as we have seen earlier these horizontal dams have cylindrical shells and are constructed in a wide range of them shell section of a tall tower may be constructed of different materials same with shell of a pressure vessel is a spherical as shape 
so this some of the the description of cell now coming to head you see always head uh, used to be curved surface someone can ask question why it is uh, curved the reason is that curves configuration are stronger and allow the heads to be thinner lighter and less expensive than flat heads that's why every pressure vessels head will be a curved you will not find a flat surface used as a head the reason is it allows economics in design it allows designer to make it thinner lighter for the same pressure it can also be used inside the vessels and are known as intermediate heads it's very important to know you should not be confused that if you sometime you come across heads inside the um, cylinder inside the cell there could be heads that is called intermediate heads used for different purpose nozzle a very important component the third one a cylindrical component that penetrate into cell or head of pressure vessel they are used for distinct purpose first is that it allows attaching pipe for flow into or out of pressure vessel it also allow attachment like uh, level gauge thermo wells pressure gauge etc it provides access to the vessel uh, this is main way entry and exit for maintenance and other services provide for direct attachment of other equipments maybe heat exchanger so nozzle is not only a connector for in to or out of the vessel it also provides access for human being it provides access for other components like pressure gauge thermo wells and other things to monitor the process inside the pressure vessel supports support is used to bear all the load uh, you may be thinking uh, why we are talking support as one of the uh, important component of pressure vessel uh, you should not be surprised because entire load of pressure vessel be it horizontal or vertical pressure vessel um, pressure vessel entire load of pressure vessel is taken by the support only and when i talk about the load it takes the dead load external load may be due to earth quake wind or loads created dynamic loads created by reaction in the pressure vessel there are different types of supports and uh, these supports are normally four types either it is saddle or leg or lug or skirt type let's see these uh, supports the example of saddle support description is given uh, i should not read it which is self explanatory the leg support again description is given for your reference you can use it this is lug support a typical type of support which you will find in industry uh, particularly in chemical industry processing industry and then skirt supports so these are the four types of supports let's uh, recap once again uh, once again i'm going back to you yes saddle leg lug and skirt support for different different application different different design uh, these uh, supports are decided by the designer in reference to applicable uh, codes okay and now uh, let's come to the regulatory framework understanding regulatory framework is very important to when somebody either engaged in designing or construction or maintenance or use of pressure vessels so either you were designer or you were just uh, uh, inspector of pressure vessel or you are manufacturer of pressure vessel or you are going to use pressure vessel uh, there are guidelines standard specification given and one need to follow that so what are those guidelines uh, this is called is2825 1969 which was reformed in the year 1977 this is called code for unfired pressure vessel and uh, i have provided a copy of this code along with this presentation uh, ujwal ujwal yes yes sir 
uh, you can forward this code to all the participant. Uh, some of them uh, might not be able to get this code. So a copy okay. of this code can be mailed to everybody. Uh, you will be having an email ID of all the participant. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, because, sir. because time and again, whatsoever I am discussing in this uh, preservation section, uh, I'll be referring this code only. Okay, okay so uh, yes. a copy of this code will be relevant for uh, all of the um, them who are participating in this uh, uh, trainings. Uh, okay. This code is based on various national and international codes, including ASME, Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code 1963. Uh, but remember, when we say pressure vessels, uh, uh, it not been to contravene any provision under Indian Boiler Act 1923. Indian Factory Act 1948 and Gas Cylinder Rules 1940. The subject of Indian Boiler Act, Indian Factory Act and Gas Cylinder Rules are different, different. Somewhere there will be concurrence on a pressure vessel, but uh, the requirement of these uh, Boiler Act or Factory Act or Gas Cylinder Rules uh, is different and then the unfired pressure vessel rules uh, IS 2825 1969. So there is no conflict. Be clear that no conflict between this code and other acts and rules. So whatsoever is stated in acts and rule and as relevant to particular pressure visual, uh, there is no conflict. That, uh, however, this code uh, uh, excludes certain pressure visuals, which you can see the section 1.1.1. So please uh, refer to section 1.1.1 to understand which all types or uh, pressure vessels are excluded from the scope of this IS code. And as I mentioned in the beginning, this IS code is the baseline or you can say Bible for design, fabrication, inspection, testing and certification of a fusion welded unfired pressure vessel in our country. I, I mean India. If something is being manufactured out of India, uh, those pressure vessels will conform to the, the uh, country's standard and they will issue the certificate before shipment. Some of the international codes on pressure vessel, as we discussed about the, as we are discussing about the legal framework, uh, we should know at least which other codes are available. Uh, one important code is American Society of Mechanical Engineers Pressure Vessel Code, then API, American Petroleum Institute's standard. PD5500 or earlier it was called BS5500. Then we have European codes and standards available. In addition, there are some other international codes available also, which you may come across when you search on or Google. In India, pressure vessels are classified. Watch, uh, we have seen earlier the types of pressure vessel. Do not be confused when I'm discussing this classification with those classification. Those classification we are based on certain characteristics based on uh, purpose, based on design, based on material used, based on engineering, based on temperature, based on pressure. We have classified uh, pressure vessel in different types. Here, classification as per this IS code talks about uh, a specific classification of which is decided based on these nine parameters which is mentioned on slide. Uh, well joint efficiency factor, radiography, limitation, types of joints, quality control, mechanical test, welding procedure, post weld treatment and pressure test. These are all nine parameters based on which uh, IS code classify pressure vessel in three class. What are those classes? Class one vessel, class two and class three. Class one vessel is used below minus 20 degree C temperature and it contains lethal or toxic substance. Class two vessel, which is not included in class one and class three are clubbed in class two. Class three vessels, these are vessels for relatively light duty, having plate thickness not in excess of 16 mm. So the criteria is given for classifying a vessel in class three. So there are three class, one, two, and three. You should remember that. 
and criteria for classification is given earlier that is nine parameters based on these nine parameters there is a table given in IAS code which classify that certain pressure vessel will fall in class one or class two or class three shall I continue hello somebody saying that no audio that your audio is coming sir this is very clear now uh, yeah one second one second is it clear now any disturbance no oh, sir it is coming sir your audio is coming sir no problem in that okay okay fine because i i got some chat here and that audio is not clear so i thought i again checked okay so we are talking about the classification of a pressure vessel uh, so once we have seen classification now there is something called categorization so what is category and what is class class we have seen the pressure vessels are classified in one two three based on nine criteria now we're saying based on the joint and location of joint pressure vessels are classified so the term category is specified the location of the joint in a vessel but not the type of joint type of joint is used for classification not for categorization please remember please remember the location of joint in the vessels used for categorization of vessels because depending upon location a special attention is needed while manufacturing while designing the joint that's why there are four types of class you can see the figure a b c and d uh, categorization given and for every type type uh, category a category b category c and category d definitions is given for what type of joint should be there what type of precaution should be taken what type of inspection should be done for category a b c and d when somebody is inspecting or verifying design and construction manufacturing they have to look into that so both sides has to ensure that they conform to the requirement given in ias code for each category a b c and d other synopsis of IS 2825 given. Uh, there are uh, three sections uh, in all. First section it talks about general materials and design. Uh, second section uh, talks about fabrication and welding uh, requirement. And uh, third section talks about inspection, taste, marking, and records. In addition, there are many appendix attached to that for further detailing. Uh, starting from abc to it goes to lmn so uh, i will encourage all the participants to uh, go through the content of this ias code uh, they can take print and study it for further understanding of pressure this is a huge subject and it is difficult to treat it uh, or do it justice with uh, such a subject with a very technical subject in one and a half hour it is very very difficult still i'm trying to give a uh, synopsis of all the aspects related to pressure vessel and now uh, in reference to the same ies code uh, there are various tests defined uh, listed there and criteria for test situation for that test is also given uh, when you talk about ndt that is non destructive test there are five types of non destructive test uh, is specified in IS code and that is visual testing, penetrant testing. That means some liquid is there. So that penetrant testing is magnetic particle testing, ultrasonic testing, and radiographic testing. Each and every test cannot be applied on each and every pressure vessels. So there are lot many considerations before deciding whether we go for visual testing or penetrant testing or magnetic particle testing or even ultrasonic or radiographic testing. 
so they, there is cost involved time involved and characteristics of the pressure vessel situation timing whether it's a construction phase or manufacturing or testing or during use we have to do so there are so many other aspects related to that uh, on field leak testing is also possible and for that uh, so many um, tests available uh, the same listed here uh, again i would like to clarify each and every test is not applicable in, in every situation depending on situation requirement cost time all factors we have to choose uh, which test we have to go uh, up, uh, on field for leak testing uh, some of the participants were writing for hazards. Definitely, we are going to discuss hazards because pressure vessel itself is uh, hazardous. And uh, there are so many source and situations which can create uh, potential safety hazards. Uh, when I talk about safety hazards, uh, I hope the participants are aware uh, what do we mean by hazards. Hazard is any source or situation that can create a risk for safety of the people working with or assisted with operation of pressure vessel or use of pressure vessel. So let's see the hazards associated with pressure vessel. The first and very important aspect is that faulty design or construction, that means manufacturing and installation, can be the biggest hazard of pressure vessel. Failure to inspect and test thoroughly, properly and frequently during construction or during operation can be a very dangerous proposition. Change in servicing con service conditions. Every pressure vessel is designed for certain temperature, certain pressure, certain hour of operation. If you change it, there could be dangerous situation and there could be a potential safety hazard. Human errors and inadequate training of operators, not knowing. The operation, not knowing the controls, could be a problem. Corrosion, erosion of construction material. Whatsoever material we are using for pressure vessels, in due course of time, there will be corrosion, erosion. Rate may vary from one material to other material, but certainly there will be corrosion or erosion. That may lead to failure of the pressure vessel. So that is one other aspect which uh, presents for uh, safety hazards. Failure or intentional defeat of safety devices. Uh, somebody knowingly can defeat safety devices or safety devices may fail on its own due to wear tear or lack of maintenance. Other is failure or override of automatic control devices. Same way, either it is uh, manipulated or not maintained that could result in uh, failure. Improper application of equipment over firing or over pressurizing that means compromising on the working condition uh, specified for the pressure vessel. Lack of planned preventive maintenance. That means we are not doing routine preventive maintenance and just depending on breakdown maintenance. That could be a issue for safety. And fatigue stress. In due course of time, uh, every other structure, like every other structure, uh, this uh, pressure vessel can also uh, develop a fatigue and stress. If we do not maintain it, we do not correct it, uh, there could be accident. What could happen out of this hazard? Say, all these hazards can lead to fire or explosion, depending upon the content, depending on the size of the pressure vessel. There could be blast and fragmentation, burn, chemical or thermal burn, could be leakage, suffocation or poisoning or asbestos contamination because some of the pressure vessel for heat management uh, or other purpose asbestos is used so in case of accident if it is rupture blast or fragmented asbestos contamination will be there in the vicinity so let us reflect upon what we learned here in this section so far uh, what is used for generation of steam and for storage and conveyance of compressed and liquefied gas? Participant can write their answer. Question number one. They fill in the blanks. Used for generation of steam and for storage. Fine. Thank you. 
four major components of pressure vessels are four major component pressure vessels are shell head nozzle support good good pressure vessel in india are regulated under is code Two eight two five. Fine. Each ASME boiler and pressure vessel code nineteen sixty three ASME stands for ASME stands for question number four. American Society. Which complete ASME stands for American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Good. How many types of pressure vessel support? Four, four types. Thank you. Faulty design is a potential hazard, safety hazard, potential safety hazard. Fine. Thank you. Let's proceed further. Thanks, participant. Uh, you have answered all the question wonderfully, very shortly, and uh, quickly, quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now related to the pressure vessel uh, and some other aspect, uh, confined space uh, is a topic uh, we discuss next. Uh, you all must be knowing what is confined space and this that. Uh, let us uh, again recap all the aspect and uh, learn something new in this presentation. Certain tragic uh, facts about confined space very important. Uh, around 1.6 million workers enter confined space annually. Untrained rescuers account for 60% of annual deaths. Most workers who survive lose time from the, their job. Employees are unaware or uneducated of the potential hazards. Employees are poorly equipped to manage the resulting situation. And asphyxiation due to hazardous atmosphere is the main cause of death. Dam ghutna, this ko bolte Hindi mein. Asphyxiation due to hazardous atmosphere is the main cause of death in confined space. With this uh, uh, introduction, I have three case studies on confined space. I'm not going to read it case study. I will uh, request you all, uh, you go through these case studies. Uh, all related to confined space accidents uh, and these are all fatal accidents. Uh, this will be an eye opener for uh, the participant. What can go wrong uh, in the confined space? So that uh, when you were, you were involved in confined space uh, maintenance or servicing or work, uh, you should take precaution. Let's try to define confined space. There cannot be one line definition of confined space. Uh, whatsoever we talk about confined space, there can be about confined space. There are three criteria for a space to be called a confined space. It should be large enough to enter and perform work. That means a person can go inside and come inside safely, come out safely. Second criteria has limited means of entry and exit. There are not many entry and exit. There may be one entry and one exit, or there may be uh, more than two entry exit, but there cannot be many entry and exit. And third is, is not designated for continuous human occupancy. So when somebody says that you define confined space, you should say, sir, confined space, uh, any space, to be defined, to be characterized at confined space has three criteria. One, it is large enough to enter and perform working, has limited entry and exit, and it is not designed for continuous human occupancy. When I say continuous, uh, like office or home or restaurant or hotel, we occupy space for three, four, five, ten hours. Same way we cannot occupy a worker, cannot occupy a space in confined space for um, eight hour, 10 hour. We we'll go, they go there, work for a few hours, come up, up again, go and go. So it is not uh, continuous, it is intermittent. 
So there are three criteria. Please remember. Hope it is clear to you all, participant. Thank you, Chris. Thank. You. Other possible characteristics. Uh, it may contain hazardous atmosphere. May I say may contain? Uh, uh, not necessarily. May contain engulfment. Put engulfment. का मतलब क्या होता है? What you mean by engulfment? May be due to liquid or may be semi-solid or something. When somebody is going to work in that, and it happens that people is submerged under that liquid, or that, that is all. May have internal configuration that could trap or an entrant. Maybe moving part, fan, or uh, any other blade which can uh, trap entrant. May contain any safety or health hazard. So, in addition to first three criteria, which is must for a space to be confined space, please remember that confined space can have some of the other characteristics like it can have hazardous atmosphere, it could have engulfment potential, it can have internal confliction that could trap an entrant or may contain some safety or health hazard inside. Okay, with this, let's move further example of confined space on the screen you can see dozens of confined spaces example given i i need not repeat it i'm holding it for 5 10 seconds you can glance it Fine. So to proceed further. Okay, let's. Now let's uh, discuss the hazards associated with confined space. Uh, there are number of hazards associated with confined space, and uh, for your understanding, uh, I am classifying these uh, in three categories: physical hazards. Then uh, I'll come to atmospheric hazards, um, biological hazards. Yes. Let's discuss physical hazards. Engulfment, the very important. Becoming trapped or enveloped by material. You know, in silos, hopper, it happens largely. And in, in uh, silos and hoppers are used in industries like anything. Not any chemical, any engineering industry, production industry, you will find a uh, use of hoppers and silos. Even for grain storage, processing, flour, flour mill, rice mill, uh, milk production plants, uh, uh, food beverage plants, you will find uh, uh, silos and hoppers. And uh, there is potential of uh, uh, entrapment in that. That is called engulfment. Then electrocution. Injury from activation of mechanical energy like fan, rotor, uh, compressor, something is there uh, inside the uh, confined space. Release of material through lines in confined space. Is it mechanical in, uh, stored energy could be there uh, in addition to electrical energy. Uh, falling objects, slick surface, sludge, water, scattered material that can lead to sleep trap. Uh, same with thermal effects, heat stress or cold state is too cold inside that or too hot. Entrapment due to unguarded rotating part of machine, agitator, augers, unguarded chairs, pulleys, rotating blades, bales, fans, moving parts, rotating parts, etc. Noise and vibration, illumination, dust inside that, unstable structure and internal condition, forcing awkward body position. So these are some of the physical hazard which I have listed for your understanding, depending upon size, type of this confined space, these hazards are possible. It is not possible that all the confined space will have all these hazards. Please note, for different, different confined space, there could be two, three, four, five, or all hazards, but not necessarily that all hazards are associated with each and every confined space. This should be clear to your mind. Then atmospheric hazards. 
what is atmospheric say may expose imply to risk of death incapacitation impairment of ability to self rescue injury or acute illness from one or more of the following causes if it is a flammable gas vapor or mist in excess of 10% of lel lel means lower explosion limit second criteria could be air borne combustible dust in excess of its lel or oxygen deficient atmosphere when i say oxygen deficient atmosphere oxygen presence is less than 19.5% or an oxygen enriched atmosphere that is also hazardous when it is more than 23.5% by volume in addition concentration of any substance exceeding its pel that means permissible exposure limit like hydrogen sulfide sulfur dioxide carbon monoxide carbon dioxide if it exceeds from its pel that is permissible exposure limit then it could be hazardous another atmospheric conditions like idlh immediately dangerous to life or health so these are atmospheric hazards present that could be present in confined space let us recap it if there are gas vapor or mist exceeding 10% of lel this could be atmospheric hazard or air borne combustible dust in excess of lel lower explosive limit or if first two is not there but oxygen is deficient then also it is atmospheric hazard suppose first three is not there but oxygen is in risk more than 23.5% then also it is hazardous or any concent material of any uh, sorry concentration of any other substance uh, i gave example like co co2 so2 hydrogen sulfide etc if it exceeds from its own permissible uh, exposure limit then it could be hazardous so what i mean to say a confined space could be hazardous space if any one of these condition exist uh, in it not necessarily all the four or five conditions should simultaneously exist in hazardous uh, confined space any one of it existing in a hazard, uh, confined space makes it hazardous then there could be biological hazards insects snakes so many things could be there if it is abandoned or some uh, left in isolation and after some time uh, months or years somebody is going to repair maybe you will find this insect and snake also so we have seen uh, hopefully participants are now clear about hazards associated with confined space once again before i start uh, other topic uh, i'll clarify physical hazards atmospheric and biological hazards we have listed so many conditions in physical hazards so many situations in atmospheric hazard and particularly two situation in biological hazards insects reptiles even mice could be hazardous now oxygen deficient atmosphere how it is developed in confined space it is a uh, um, necessary for us to know unless until we know probably not be in a position to see uh, how best we can manage oxygen in that uh, confined space uh, it could be inadequate ventilation or consumption of oxygen from welding bacterial action that means decomposition or rust i mean within a confined space if ventilation is a problem that could lead to deterioration of oxygen level if oxygen is consumed in welding you are undertaking welding and fresh air is not coming in confined space for welding you need oxygen so it will consume oxygen present in the atmosphere that is confined space uh, space atmosphere and there will be deficiency of oxygen in that space same way if decomposition takes place suppose a biological substance is lying there so there will be bacterial growth and the decomposition process will consume oxygen present in the confined space even rusting use oxygen present in confined space so due to all these reasons 
देयर कुड बी डेफिशियंसी ऑफ ऑक्सीजन लेवल इन कन्फाइन एक्सेस वन सेट ऑफ प्रॉब्लम यू हैव सीन नाउ ऑक्सीजन कैन बी डिस्प्लेस्ड फ्रॉम द कन्फाइन एक्सेस आल्सो बाय सिंपल एस्पिक्शंस लाइक नाइट्रोजन और कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड gases which are heavier than oxygen is capable to replace oxygen from the atmosphere so if uh, confined is which occupied by nitrogen or carbon dioxide definitely it will have deficiency of oxygen because these uh, gases are heavier than oxygen they will replace it and yes flammable atmosphere from gases or vaporized solvent in rich oxygen this could be also a region for uh, reduction in oxygen level in confined space and a toxic gas could also be so we have discussed here what could be the region for deficient atmosphere in a uh, deficiency of oxygen in confined space and table in this slide you can say uh, nitrogen methane carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfides given are uh, the color order types density lel uel pl everything given the last you see hazards what is hazard associated with nitrogen may displace oxygen and cause asphyxiation this is very important as such nitrogen is not a pro problem but it is capable to displace oxygen from confined space because uh, it is heavier than oxygen methane in case of methane it is hazardous it is flammable and explosive it can support fire it can catch fire and so there can be explosion in limited space uh, carbon monoxide itself is proven uh, carcinogen uh, sorry uh, asphyxiant um, and it supports a, a fire hydrogen sulfide it produces a smell very typical smell and person can be unconscious if inhalation is too much person can also lose life again uh, let's uh, come to confined space classification uh, in foreign countries uh, um, they used to uh, classify uh, confined space uh, in two types Uh, one based on permits uh, and other based on characteristics so uh, let's see on characteristics so there are class a class b and class c class a that is called idlh where i immediate danger to life or health exist i mean as soon as a person enter the confined is without any control the life or health of the person is danger then it is called class a may contains oxygen deficiency explosive or flammable atmosphere and or concentration of toxic substance beyond the permissible limit so class a is very dangerous then class b is species potential for injury if proper safety steps are not followed and class c species has potential but would not require any special modification of the workplace hello okay i will repeating uh, some of the participant refer that uh, voice is problem uh, once again i am repeating that confined spaces are classified based on two uh, aspect one is characteristics of confined space and other is permit condition so based on the characteristics it is classified in class a class b and class c class where idlh atmosphere exists class b which is not idlh but certain controls required and class c has no characteristics of class a and class b here classification based on permit requirement you can see if oxygen is less than 19.5 and more than or more than 23.5% then permit will be required if flammability is more than 10% of lfl that means lower flammable limit then again 
permit is required or if toxicity is more than 50% of PEL or that is called threshold limit value then again permit will be required. So there are three criteria for confined space to be a permit confined space or non permit confined space. Am I clear? Yes. Criteria is oxygen between 19.5 to 23.5 percent, flammability more than 10 percent of LFL, toxicity more than 50 percent of PEL or TLB, then permit required. If oxygen is between 19.5 to 23.5, LFL is more than 10 percent. Uh, sorry, uh, flammability is more than 10 percent and toxicity is more than 50 percent of PLV, then it is not required. That means such confined space does not require permit for work. Okay. Let's uh, have a look on regulatory framework. You see chapter 4 of Act 1948. There are three sections devoted on confined space. Not full section. Uh, you'll find reference of confined space in these sections. Section 36. That is title is precautions against uh, dangerous fumes gas. Section 36A precaution against the use of portable electric light. Section 37. That is explosive or inflammable dust. In 29 CFR, that is CFR stand for Code for Federal, uh, Federal, uh, Federal Republic, USA. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, six appendix given on permit required confined space. And this is available online. You can download, not an issue. That's why I'm not reproducing here. Now let's concentrate on protocol which we should follow for confined space entry. This is very uh, important aspect. So we should pay a special attention. If you are going to engage uh, people for working inside confined space, this is not a normal work and you must pay a special attention. You must do homework. Uh, Without doing homework, without any preparation, you should not allow your people to enter in confined space because it could be life threatening. So let us see the uh, protocol. What it says first, identify and understand confined space. Before you decide anything, you need to have a survey. You need to review design, drawing, processes, materials. What is inside the confined space? You can understand by reviewing the design, drawings, process, material, or last time maintenance details. Physical inspection on site is very important. And if required, testing of gases to a certain whether we have atmospheric hazards or not. That means oxygen deficiency or oxygen enrichment, toxicity, flammability. We need to ascertain. And when we'll do that? Before deciding the methodology of working in confined space, this reconnaissance service should be done by the team. Okay. And while doing that, desktop study should be done by reviewing design, drawings, processes, or materials used. Fair enough. Then, after completing the first aspect, then you come to hazard risk assessment or job safety analysis. Accordingly, you start preparing preparation for confined space working and first and foremost constitute team who will be the intent who will be the attendant who will act as entry supervisor and who will be the emergency rescue personnel arrange organize requisite pps you know depending upon the requirement you may require a special type of pps and rescue mechanism so you have to first arrange all these logistics then arrange organize training of team because uh, intent attendant entry supervisor emergency rescue person all these put together forms a team for confined space working and they needs to be on same page their understanding of confined space hazard requirement of work hazard associated of work 
and what should be the rescue mechanism should be known to each and everybody involved in the team. So, entrant, attendant, entry supervisor, and rescuer should be on the same page. For that, a deep briefing and briefing is required before the start of the work at the end of the work. Each session, then entry, obtain permit to work if it requires, depending upon permit condition or not permit condition or company's policy or guideline. Briefing of team, entry of for work and briefing post work. So this is a broad protocol for uh, um, entry into the confined space. Let me repeat. Before you start any hazard assessment, you should do a survey. First desktop survey, then on the site survey, testing of confinement if required, if doubt is there. Then do HIRA or job safety analysis, prepare your team, arrange logistic, and then plan entry as per permit requirement. Atmos testing is also very important. If uh, at all during survey, site survey, you decide that uh, considering the history of uh, the confined space, uh, we need to ascertain atmospheric uh, hazard, then testing will be required. You need to select uh, equipment accordingly. There are nine basic rules for testing. First rule, monitor in proper order. You should monitor first corrosivity, then oxygen, then flammability and toxicity, not in the reverse order. Uh, why? Suppose uh, you are not measuring corrosivity, you are going for oxygen level and atmosphere inside is very corrosive, then what will happen? Uh, the sensor of the instrument, monitoring instrument, will start malfunctioning. It will not get the current uh, correct result. Uh, you may be confused. So for monitoring to be effective, first thing that the instrument should be very okay. And order of testing is very important. So first test corrosivity, then go for oxygen level check, then check for flammability, and last should be checking for toxicity. Rule two, consider vapor density of gases. You know, certain gases will be high, heavier than air and uh, settle in the bottom of the confined space. Some other gases which will be lighter than air will be floating and occupying a space in the upper surface of the confined space. That must be noted. Know the limitation of gas monitor. So when supplier gives you a, or you select a particular monitor, uh, it suggests what are the requirement condition for uh, use. You should uh, be aware and accordingly should apply. No operational parameter of gas monitor accordingly. Realize that many flammable gases are also toxic. So when you go to test for toxicity, there can be fire. That's why flammability is the last thing which we need to check. Remember some vapor migraine towards the exterior of the surface. Calibrate monitoring devices in clean air before using. So calibration very important before they use. Sample from a small opening in the space and position your up one. Uh, this is also a problem. Uh, when you are testing, many times it happens that people are <coughs> facing the, the wind direction. So they in, may inhale the gas coming out of the opening of the port you have prepared for sampling. So be ready uh, that your face should not be opposite to the wind direction. If it happens, the person who is going to test may inhale gases coming out of the opening. So it should be in other direction. And definitely before you start uh, testing, uh, charging, battery, etc., should be so all logistics should be okay. So these are nine rules uh, one should keep in mind if uh, you are involved or in monitoring or you are directing a monitoring exercise for a confined space. What should be sampling strategy? Just uh, before actual sampling, you should do evaluation testing. 
this will help to understand the level of hazards then verification testing and testing in due course when you are actually working that time testing so there are three types of uh, testing one evaluation then verification and then during test during the work as uh, i mentioned you earlier that there are certain gases heavier than air and certain gases lighter than air so in confined space we need to measure for all gases at every three to four feet uh, from top to bottom so that we understand the all the constituents present in the confined space and their concentration nothing should be missed out so every three to four feet support uh, it is 10 feet deep uh, so there will be three to four sampling location particularly from uh, uh, downward starting from tip to the bot, uh, bottom of the confined airspace okay now entry is required suppose it is confined space which requires permit then what should be there in permit entry conditions should be specified isolation of a space how we are going to do if purging is required inerting flushing or ventilation is required who will be the key personnel entry time frame a person will enter for half an hour 45 minutes or two hour in one go or there will be two three four entrant one entrant a will go work for half an hour come out then entrant b will go finish his work come out and then c or d same way so we have to define uh, the sequence and duration of each uh, person then external hazards and means of rescue so these are all part of entry permit entry permit is not just uh, uh, like height work permit or hot work permit in normal condition okay or welding permit in confined space working you have to be very exhaustive very detailing is needed every thing should be known to the team and everything should be planned it should not be a surprise certain equipment you need to plan in advance one is generic personal protective equipment there can be a special personal protective equipment needed like multi gas meter scaba self containing breathing apparatus which you call it air compressor ventilation device rescue mechanism rescue gears or even first aid kits communication device escape ladders lifeline supplied air respirator so depending upon the requirement depending on the situation of confined space duration of work a type of work involved we need to decide what type of personal protective equipment or a special personal protective equipment required and that should be arranged and people should be trained on using that it is not that just uh, uh, before a start of confined space entry you just give the pp and ask them to use it they may not be comfortable they may not be conversant with use so we need to demonstrate they should become conversant with use of all these personal protective equipment or a special particularly scaba how to use a scaba how to use a scap ladder or lifeline or supplied air respirator even communication devices then permit space history this uh, one should know work generated hazards or conditions then external hazards or conditions what do you mean by external hazards and conditions confined space uh, you are working in a confined space and near that area if some other work is going on some maintenance work going on some other thing is going that can create some hazard which you have not noticed earlier which you have not thought of which can be infringement with your work or can create a hazard which is not included in your hazard or job uh, risk analysis or job safety analysis so please be aware 
what could be the external factor which can do infringement with your work and can create a condition unsafe for the person working there. So current evaluation of the space and site restrictions and control. Light entry, exit, vehicle entry, vehicle uh, exit, uh, personal entry and exit that needs to be controlled. If at all we have to do energy isolation, how we'll do that? In a confined so suppose you are working in a reactor or you are working in a pressure vessel. That's a confined so definitely a confined space. So how will work in that? There will be so many components which uses electricity in this reactor or vessel. So those energy needs to be isolated by using lockout tag out. If it is electricity. If it is liquid, pre, uh, pressure gas or pressure liquid, steam, so what can do? Blending, blanking, double block or bleed. So there are so many ways and means to isolate electrical, mechanical, and uh, potential energies. Depending upon requirement, you have to choose what type of isolation you are going to apply for that. Then a space preparation before entering, like simply, uh, if you notice, even in municipal corporation, uh, when they used to allow entry of workers or maintenance of sewer or just cleaning, cleaning of sewer lines, uh, they keep the sewer cover open for hour or two before they allow entry. The purpose is allowing atmospheric air to ingress into uh, and dilute the accumulation of hydrogen sulfide or sulfur dioxide gas or methane generated by decomposition of substances inside that in spite of doing that it may not be possible to uh, create atmosphere for entry so that time pressurization outside air purging may be needed so we need to uh, decide whether we need to depressurize empty it clean or cool or reduce or control. So I'm talking about ventilation. So either you can pressurize or you can suck out. In both the cases, depending on the configuration of confined space, uh, you can decide. Heat stage concept is very important. Many times it is very difficult for worker to enter and um, work there. So maybe we need to provide a fan. But how to provide that fan? because providing fine itself could be hazardous because it is a rotating component. So better we provide some other solution, some other ventilation. Ventilation as I discussed earlier, supply or positive pressure ventilation or exhaust ventilation, local negative pressure ventilation and positive negative both ventilation possible. So these are all possible mechanism for facilitating energy isolation, space preparation, and ventilation. For ESCO, we should be ready. We should do homework. We should prepare a plan and always advisable test the plan before the actual start of work. Testing always helps. That means demonstration. Who will play what? So for that purpose, within the team it is always advisable to have a demonstration full press demonstration of rescue so that all are on same page in case of accident we are not panic uh, there could be two types of rescue one horizontal and uh, other could be vertical rescue they, uh, again it will depend upon the position and the configuration of confined space uh, everywhere horizontal or everywhere vertical types of rescue may not be possible. It also depends upon what type of rescue mechanism we are selecting. Uh, rescue system provides uh, two uh, sub, uh, alternative. One is non-entry rescue. That means the entrant, uh, the rescuer is not required to enter into the confined space. While being uh, keeping himself safe, he can be able to rescue the person in stress by using the rescue mechanism and in other case uh, it requires a rescuer to enter into confined space 
and do the rescue operation. So again, what type of system you are selecting uh, will shape the process further. So rescue type and rescue mechanism is important to define your, uh, decide your rescue process. Once you have rescued the victim, it is not sufficient only to rescue. There could be two situations. Victim can have apparent injury or cannot have apparent injury. In both the situation, what you what we need to do should be known to all, should be listed, should be written down, and all logistics should be available on the spot. Along with tie up of the ambulance services with the hospital, so that in once rescued from the confined space, we are not wasting time to rush victim to the hospital. He should be given immediate medical attention as required. Let us uh, uh, have a recap what we uh, learned in this section uh, so far. Uh, I'm reading that and the participant can uh, write their answer at A, B, C. What are the three characteristics of confined space that may include A? Fine, thank you. Oxygen in rich confined space is Oxygen in rich confined space is dangerous, hazardous for safety. Okay. Third question Oxygen level for non permit required confined space is Yes, between 19.5 to 23.5 percent. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks, Mohammed. IDLS stands for immediate danger to life and Thank you, gender. OSA stands for 20, OSA, sorry, OSA standard 29 CFR 1910.146 is applicable to confined space. Railway section of Factory 1948 applicable to confined six spaces are we have seen three section. Yes, 36, 36, 6A, and 37. These are all applicable for confined space under Fact 1948. And I will encourage all participants to have it. I think you will have copy of Fact Act. It is easily available in each uh, uh, factory and offices. You can refer section 36, 36A, and 37. And as for this IS code is concerned for pressure vessel, uh, I have already uh, provided a copy uh, to Ujwal. He will uh, email to all the parties. They can refer it. Okay. Sir. Okay. okay sir. Um, now uh, we can have a, a quick uh, answer, question answer session. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, first question is, uh, so is it any standard for keeping dia or height for vertical pressure vessel to keep as 5 is to 1 ratio? Yeah, the, the code is specified. I have given one example in, uh, on this uh, slide. There are criteria specified, detailed design criteria given. Uh, sir, second question is that what is the criteria to select safe cylinder and spherical shape? I could not get it. Please repeat. Uh, what is the criteria to select uh, the shape of that uh, pressure vessel? I think. Uh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, spherical or um, cylindrical same. Yeah. Uh, as we have seen a slide, uh, let me. It is used for uh, either a storage or transportation or processing. And again, depending on the if it is process uh, processing situation, then generation of heat and pressure in the process is considered. 
and a spherical shape is always used where there is tremendous pressure like atomic power plant so all atomic reactor will be spherical in shape same way you'll find that this type of things are used in um, storage of uh, um, petroleum and uh, other products so it depends upon what you are going to do with that pressure vessel whether it is going to use as a reaction chamber or activation chamber some process is going on inside that okay or it is only a storage like uh, uh, you go to refinery you will find tall tall very tall pre, uh, pressure vessel where fragmentation takes place so crude oil is pumped and pass through tray 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 and goes up and at the end you will find the flue gases coming out of and it goes for flare and at different different level petrol diesel and this aviation fuel is generated so this pressure vessel is designed as a uh, tower maybe 150 meter 200 or 300 meter so depending upon requirement the shape size is designed selected by the designer and reference is given in the code hello uh, uh, sir next question is how to check oxygen level in confined space to ensure we can work in confined space it is very easy and uh, now uh, only if you have to uh, check only oxygen level it is very easy uh, handheld instruments are available uh, sizes like uh, uh, earlier motorola mobile phone uh, that uh, size uh, and uh, you can just um, um, held it uh, and uh, measure it uh, one way there other way there is probe attached to that you can just uh, insert the probe in the confined space the reading will come on the screen you can see that it is a same way uh, there are different uh, gases co co2 so2 and that you need to monitor the multi uh, gas meter is also available okay only thing that first you have to calibrate it it comes with calibration but before use in fresh air again you have to calibrate it and then you can use it yes sir the next question is uh, what is the effect if oxygen levels goes more than 23.5 percent uh, uh, this will be explosive this will be explosive uh, slight uh, uh, friction slight very slight friction also can create fire explosion that's why it should not be more than 23.5 percent it should be less than 19.5 percent uh, person will not survive long okay and beyond 23.5 percent it will create explosive atmosphere that's why we have to restrict between 19.5 and 23.5 percent okay so uh, as per factory act 1948 steam generators or vessels used for steam generation are covered in boilers not in pressure vessels yes. but in your but in our presentation on of first slide it mm -hmm. is mentioned as one of the use, uses of pressure vessel is steam generation mm -hmm. please uh -huh. clarify uh, yeah sir uh, uh, there are certain uh, issues uh, uh, if you um, uh, read that factory uh, indian boiler act 1923 and this pressure vessel uh, code exclusion is given uh, at section number 1.1.1 okay certain types of uh, steam generators are included under this uh, um, code and certain are excluded part of uh, boiler indian boiler act so I will advise which type of steam generation is there, what type of construction, uh, whether it should be covered in the Indian Boiler Act or it should be covered in uh, IS code, which we have we have been discussing. Uh, 
so that classification is given there is a long list of uh, exclusion given so i will uh, suggest you to go through that right now it is not possible for me to open that uh, uh, to clarify but section 1.1.1 i'm doing four times 1.1.1.1 you refer that first chapter of the code uh as per which standard the classification of confined spaces are made like uh, class a class b and class c mm -hmm. uh say uh as i told you that uh, no indian classification available for that uh this is as per 29 cfr which i was referring for federal republic osha osha's regulation usa uh okay sir uh what is the non hazardous uh, confined space permit procedure see uh, example for non hazardous uh, like uh, um basement uh, basement of a building okay uh, maybe uh, one basement or two basement or three third three basement so basement of a building is also a confined space there will be one entry or one exit okay and uh, as such there won't be a problem of uh, um, other gases uh, toxic gases like uh, but there can be problem of uh, oxygen suppose we are talking basement 3 that means 9 meter below below ground and in the vicinity of that building if structures are already existing super structures are there then sub supply of air is restricted in the basement that's why in basement uh, uh entry exit is there why it is confined space entry exit is limited one entry one exit is there without light without uh, fan a person cannot occupy the basement for long time okay and if it is so then there will be problem so there will be problem for health this is an example of uh, same way um, water tank every society will find water tank will be underground water tank or overhead water tank a person goes inside for cleaning every 6 month or 3 month what so be there will be this is a non permit confined space example number where restriction of entry exit is there but atmospheric hazard is not an issue okay just open it keep and go work and come out but it's not suitable for long term occupancy in water tank one cannot be there even it is very large enough we cannot be there for 3 4 hours okay sir uh, what is the difference between uh, tlv and uh, pel if both are same then for co as per your slide is pel 50 ppm and tlv is 245 ppm how see uh, both are not same uh, both have different different uh, purpose uh, uh, let me cite that uh, let me go to the slide okay for yeah. me to explain that can you open that hold it this is the slide yes it is coming so yeah uh question was about tlv yeah tlv and uh, tlv and pel ha huh. permissible exposure limit hai and tlv is a threshold limit value threshold limit value permissible is the safest limit okay in case of carbon monoxide you are saying that is 50 ppm this was the question na and threshold yes. limit uh, threshold limit value is 35 ppm okay in normal condition pel is applicable that means permissible exposure limit is applicable normal condition in 90% of the time or 99% of the time this limit should be adhered to but sometime it may happen that you have to work for very less time 
entry and exit is very five minutes, 10 minutes or something like that, not half an hour or one hour. You can expose to a person to this 35 ppm environment also. You are getting me? So both are. One is normal routine permissible exposure limit and other is threshold limit in dire need ultimate situation. You can stretch to this condition. For some time. Next question is uh, for S2S. PEL is higher than TLV. Why? For a S2S. Uh, uh, yes, for S2S, PEL is higher than TLV. Why? Yes, this is what I answered right now. See, PEL is normal. What I say, permissible exposure limit for long duration. Permissible exposure limit is always for long duration. Long duration does not mean one day, two day. That means for minutes, in hour and half hour, one hour. And threshold limit value is you can subject a person to this limit for some time. You not beyond that. That is the, see. Otherwise, I have explained the threshold expert limit is always less and permissive expert limit is always high. Always high for any uh, gases. So when you talk about threshold limit value. And permissible exposure limit value both will be different in all, all the gases. Uh, what I'll suggest, I think. Uh, I, I need some more clarification on that. Uh, I will answer this question with a little more example and send it to you on email. Okay, you can pass it to the concerned participant or everybody. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. okay. And uh, IS 2835 is equivalent to ASME section uh, 8 division 1, 2, 3. See, uh, you can say equivalent because uh, it is based on those standard only. Our IS code is based on ASME standards and other international standards all, all the time available. Okay, so you can say equivalent. So a few new criteria are there uh, to suit Indian conditions. TLV is the minimum uh, allowable concentration for eight hours of duration. As mm. per standard CO TLV is 50 ppm. Uh, mm. Can you please mention the standard? Yes. I I'll mention the standard. I I'll answer uh, both the things. Right. Yeah, I don't you have I but let's see. Oh. Okay. Next. Next. What all precautions should be kept while doing odd job in confined space? Oh, very important. Uh, hot job is the most dangerous uh, work in confined space. First of all, uh, you have to ensure there is no atmospheric hazard in confined space. No atmospheric hazard, no toxicity, no flammability issue, no enriched oxygen, no less oxygen. Enriched oxygen is also hazardous because as soon as you <coughs> light or start building there will be explosion in confined space if there is less oxygen and you start building it will consume oxygen in that from the confined space and the person working there will fight for oxygen and ultimately collapse so uh, for hot work you need to uh, test confined space if required ventilation to be provided oxygen level to be monitored regularly while working the confinement and exhaust should be open. 
otherwise uh, the build up of a smoke uh, will create problem for the a person working inside next question is a standard confined space work permit maybe uh, just minute, sir, this is not a question uh, is any third party certificate is required for chemical storage tank yes third party chemical storage tank required say all chemical storage tank is uh, you can say uh, if it is uh, Store be above atmospheric pressure like LPG, ammonia, which is transported in pressure vessel only, na? be it uh, rail tanker or uh, a truck tanker, uh, or even during a storage also. If it is uh, above atmospheric pressure, then it is called pressure vessel. And in all such cases, during design, during construction, selection of material, before com commissioning of the pressure vessel itself, it is tested certified and during operation also uh, every uh, year or there are duration for different different things it has to be re-inspected re-certified sir next question is who has yeah. the there, there, there are inspectors available under factory act also under boiler act also boiler inspectors are there for covering uh, the vessels under uh, boiler act, like a uh, fired boiler. Uh, but for other pressure vessels, also under factory act, uh, there are uh, um, registered inspector uh, authorities defined who has to do what. Okay. Okay, so uh, who has the authority or who can check the atmospheric condition in confined space? Who has authority? Uh, when we yeah. talk about authority, uh, are we talking about legal authority or we are talking with uh, professional authority, organizational authority? Suppose uh, one can, uh, pressure vessel is taken for services, taken, uh, taken out of services for uh, maintenance and other purposes. So somebody has to go inside and uh, or do the servicing of whatsoever. So this is within a company. Somebody will be doing that or it is outsourced to some contractor. A contract team will be doing that. If we are talking this, then the person who is competent in terms of understanding the confined space, okay, the hazard associated with that, who has experience of working in such atmosphere, they can be involved as team leader or the competent person for that. And under his guidance or her guidance control, the process can be completed. If you are talking about legal authority, that means who can inspect, who can authorize, that is different thing altogether. You were getting my uh, argument. Authority yes, sir. of two types, like legal authority. Once a system is taken out of for services after services also somebody has to certify that after service there is no problem with the pressure vessel it can be taken back again into the service so somebody has to certify that is different thing altogether that authority is available defined by uh, under factory act and other things okay for undertaking confined space job who will enter, what will be the condition, who will issue the work permit, who will be the skewer, who will control the entire process, that as per operation control procedure of the company concerned. Is it yes, clear? Sir. Yes, sir, it is very clear now, I think. So. Uh, sir, I think uh, so you have answered uh, most of the questions you have answered, sir. Uh, what I'll request, uh, you just uh, drop me an email, uh, a small email, of the question on TLB and PEL. Okay, uh, yes, though, though I answered, but uh, I think uh, I myself is not very clear on that. So I will again uh, cross-check the references and uh, uh, give a reply. Uh, you can okay, circulate okay, it back to all the participants. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. 
thank you sanjay sir for uh, giving a nice presentation on uh, confined space and uh, pressure vessel safety and uh, thank you sir thank you thank you very much thank, thank you sir thank you all the participants yeah today we have uh, finished up in, well within the time sir <laughs> <laughs> So yes, sir. Also, we could have done it, but anyway. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Actually, on that date, uh, Mr. Sarma has told me that uh, he will speak for only 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but you took one hour. <laughs> yeah, sir. Actually, I have not. Uh, I I have not control on him also. On the, <laughs> you, you can. You can do. That's the problem, you, sir. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, Sanjay, sir. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Preeti. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, all the participants. Uh, thank you, Preeti, and uh, thank you once again, sir, uh, Sanjay, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye. Bye, sir.